This is episode 13 with Tucker Max. Hi, my name is Mike Gillard, and this is Self-Made Man, the podcast for men who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of their lives. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You know, 10 years ago, I wrote my very first book. It was just 55 pages long. I wrote it in Microsoft Word, and I never bothered to have it edited or spell-checked. And yet that book would go on to sell over 100,000 copies self-published and bring in over $25 million in revenue. So those 55 pages literally made my career and put me on the map. Writing a book can without a doubt be a life-changing endeavor. All you have to do is look at my story or Robert Kiyosaki or Tim Ferriss's. But it is also a hugely time-sucking, hair-pulling experience that can frankly be fraught with peril, especially if you pursue traditional publishing. Well, with most industries these days, the book industry has been turned upside down as well. And today, I would like to introduce you to my friend here in Austin, Mr. Tucker Max. Now, when you want to publish or launch a book, Tucker is the guy that you call. He and his business partner, Ryan, have been behind all of the major book launches, including Tony Robbins uh, here a couple of months ago. And Tucker's first book, I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, has been a number one New York Times bestseller for over five years. It has sold over two million copies. His second and third book were bestsellers as well, uh, selling over one million copies. So he knows this industry inside and out, backwards and forwards. He knows the game. He knows the rules. And uh, as you're going to hear today, they are quite interesting indeed. So last year, he launched a new company called Book in a Box to help busy entrepreneurs publish amazing books in record-setting time. And when I say record-setting, I mean in 12 hours or less. He is the guy that I called when I wanted to publish magnetic sponsoring and finally put it into hard copy form and post it on Amazon. So he is the guy that I hired for that. So if you've ever thought about using a book to build your business or build your brand, this is a must-listen podcast. And with that being said, please welcome Mr. Tucker Max. Welcome back to Self-Made Man, everybody. Mike Dillard here, and I have an unbelievably valuable episode for you today with a good friend of mine and in many ways, a business mentor, specifically when it comes to the topic we are going to be discussing today, Mr. Tucker Max. Tucker, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mike. I, it's funny you call me a mentor because I feel like you've made a lot more money than me and I've learned more from you than you've t- uh, learned from me. Well, you know, I, well, one, thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I think you and I have had similar but varied experiences in life and in business that we both, you know, respect and, and learn from equally. And uh, I know that's, that's definitely the case with me, specifically when it comes to the topic we are going to discuss today, which is books. And how do you turn a book into a business? How do you turn a book into a branding extravaganza and really change your life using books? Because that has been a proven method for doing exactly those things over the past few years that we're going to be discussing about today. And you're one of the best that I know in the world, and you helped me launch my book recently. So I'm, uh, I'm super excited to have you on to discuss this topic, man. Yeah, awesome. Happy to talk about it. So... This is this has become an area of expertise for you. And if you could tell people a little bit about your history, how you became a best-selling author, and uh, just a little, you know, right. five-minute background. <clears throat> right. So super short story was I, my friends and I left law school, and I hated my job, and I hated what I was doing. So I spent most of my time writing emails to my friends that would like make them laugh, you know. And uh, the emails ended up being funny to way more people than my friends. And so I, I tried to get a book deal and no publisher would have me, no agent would rep me. So I put my stuff up on the internet for free. It kind of blew up. This girl sued me, uh, a bunch of other things, and then ended up getting a book deal. The book became a bestseller, spent five or six years on the bestseller list. I hope they serve beer in hell. It was number one for quite a while. It sold... That book alone has sold 2 million copies, uh, 30 languages, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then I wrote two others sort of in that sort of series, which is uh, the New York Times said I invented a new literary genre called fratire. So it's basically just stories of young guys doing stu- stupid stuff that young guys do. Through that process of writing sort of those books, it, it's funny. Like I didn't – I went to law or to undergrad for econ and uh, law school obviously for law. 
I never, ever, ever thought I would be a lawyer or write, or I'm sorry, be a writer or write books or anything like that. And so when I got into sort of writing and publishing and, and, and entertainment, I came from a business law background, right? So I kind of looked at the, I didn't look at this world like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy to be accepted as a writer. I never uh, cared about being a writer. I cared about like doing, you know, like cool business things. And the business world of writing and publishing is totally jacked up and it makes no sense at all. And so what I ended up doing was sort of upending it. So I actually started my own publishing company and not like self-publishing, pub- uh, publishing, like self-publishing is great for a lot of people and I, and I love it. But I, when I say started a publishing company, I mean, I had, you know, Simon and Schuster is my distributor, full bookstore distribution, international distribution you know, like printing books from, you know, the uh, bank printing, which is one of the biggest printers in the world, et cetera, et cetera. I, I was one of the first people that was sort of an author as publisher model. I, I don't want to say I invented it because like Mark Twain did it in the 1800s and stuff, but I was one of the first modern ones to do it. And the people that you hear about now, like Hugh Howie and John Locke and all those people doing that, they learned all of it from me. And I mean that very literally, like I taught I taught Hugh Howie's agent exactly what to do. I showed her my contract. I, I walked her in to Simon, et cetera. And so like uh, I sold that – I turned that into a company. I sold that. And then uh, I've done some other publishing things since then. Yeah. I mean it's it's unbelievable when when you – you know, are ready to publish a book, it's become very well known that you are the guy to call on this because you know the inside out details. Like the information that you and I have discussed about the book industry over a few glasses of wine is shocking. It, yeah. could, it could be a book in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the, how the sausage is made in the book industry, like obviously we won't talk too long on it, yeah. but just know that like it is the most ridiculous, preposterous, it's not just set of rules and, and the way it works, but like the people in the book industry. Be, here's why it's so crazy. Almost any industry, at the end of the day, what really matters is sales, right? And so you know if you're selling more, like everything goes, like revolves around sales and, and how much money is made from sales. That's not true in books. So many people in the traditional book industry don't care about making money and don't care about book sales. In fact, in a, in a way, they look down on it. What they care about is status with social elites in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And so once you understand that, then everything in traditional publishing starts to make sense. So let's talk a little bit about why someone like myself or anyone out there, other entrepreneurs out there would want to write a book. Because you know, at the end of the day, guys, nobody here wants to write a book. There's another benefit to it that we're ultimately after, whether that's revenue, whether it's status or prestige or notability or you know, using it you know, for PR purposes as a front-end product to you know, your brand, whatever it may be, there's a lot of end result benefits that we're ultimately after. And so how do we use a book to build your business, which is, you know, really the the root of the matter here. And so what I want to recognize and acknowledge first and foremost, is the power of a book when it's executed and written correctly. And, you know, some prime examples of that are one, I have to start with myself, you know, when I published my first book, which it's, it was never even a real book, Tucker. It was just an ebook that I wrote myself in Microsoft Word and never had even spell checked. Well, I mean, Dillard, hold on. Let's just yeah. say, I, I, let's get rid of that s- social or societal trope right now. A real book is something that you sit down and take the time to write. It was a real book. It might not have been traditionally published, but in fact, I, like, I wish I had, in a lot of ways, not traditionally published any of my stuff because I would have made a lot more money. So don't like, don't put yourself down and be like, oh, it's not a real book. I, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people bought that and spent a lot of money, and they ended up making way more money because of what you wrote, right? Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, and that was really the point was that it, it doesn't have to go down the traditional, you know, format to to make a huge impact. And for those of you who know my story, you know that I, I wrote that book, Magnetic Sponsoring, when I was in my 20s and waiting tables, and it went on to you know, make over $25 million in revenue. And that book literally is what put me on the map as an entrepreneur. Still today, you know, I spoke at an event in Las Vegas last week and people were coming up with copies of that book, having me autograph it, you know, basically saying that it changed their lives here 10 years later, which is amazing. So that's my personal story. We all know, you know, Tim's story, uh, you know, the four hour work week, that's what put Tim on the map. You know, that's what opened up all of the doors in his career and continues to do so today. 
You have Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Robert Kiyosaki. Nobody knew who Robert was before that book. So that book put him on the map as well. And I'm sure there's example after example after example that we can go down. So we need to start by acknowledging the power of a book and what it can do to spread ideas and to give you credibility. And Tucker, let me, let me ask you real quick. What have you seen when it comes to you know our fellow entrepreneurs in, in the various industries that they are in do with their books? How have they, why have they written books and what have they done with them to build their brand and to build their business from a strategic perspective? Right, exactly. So uh, you, you nailed it uh, about books. No one cares about having a book or writing a book. They care about what a book gets them, right? And so uh, I've seen, uh, my, my company does this. We help people who have great books or great ideas for books, turn them into books in the, uh, who don't have the time to write it. And so let, let's go through some examples. Um, I've seen, we've worked with a doctor who was a surgeon, 30 years a surgeon, and he had basically a surgical consulting company. and He wanted to become a, a thought leader in, in his space, right? So what we did was we, we helped him figure out, all right, so his goal is to become a thought leader. Then we walked him through, well, what audience do you have to reach to become a thought leader? Like who do you care about influencing, right? Whose thoughts do you want to lead? And he basically wanted to lead like the surgical and, and overall medical teaching community, right? Okay, fine. So we asked him, well, what do you know? that that community would find valuable. And it, it took us a while to really kind of nail it uh, because that's the kind of funny thing as we see is a lot of professionals have amazing wisdom in their heads, but they don't exactly know how to position it or what, uh, what other people will find valuable. And what we realized is that this guy had amazing wisdom in his head. He knew exactly how to run your surgical career. And would you believe, Mike, that they don't teach you anything about that in med school? No, I'm so, I didn't know that. I had no idea that in med school they teach you everything about how to take a gallbladder out, but nothing about how to take uh, how to run your career. And so he went on this big rant about that, and we're like, "There's your book right there." And so we helped him. Basically, there's three ways you can go in a surgical career, and and so the whole book is about this. And he's like, "It's so funny." He was like. At first, he's like, but, you know, there's only 5,000 new surgeons a year. Like, it's a small market for this book. And we're like, hello? Like, no one has written anything like this. Every single surgeon who graduates from med school every year will buy this book, right? So you're looking at five to 10,000 copies sold every year. And you are now the granddaddy of surgical careers. You are the guy that everyone's going to look to just the way that everyone uh, looks to you for network marketing sort of advice because of your book. He's now the thought leader for that space, right? So uh, that's how you become a thought leader, basically, is that you have to figure out who, what group are you trying to influence and what wisdom or knowledge do you have in your head that they will find valuable and you need to put that in a book. Right. So being a thought leader is super, super, um, you know, that it can be called being an authority or being influential or whatever. Those are that's very, 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 very valuable for business people. Uh, another great way is if you are a consultant or uh, a speaker or anything, a prof any sort of professional. Right. Here's the funny thing. No one realizes. So everyone knows what the biggest search engine on the Internet is. That's Google. Right. And a lot of people know what the second biggest search engine is, which is actually YouTube. But Mike, do you know what the third biggest search engine on the internet is? Um, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's Facebook. not Bing. Facebook. No, it's not Facebook and it's not Bing. It's actually Amazon. Uh -huh. And it is the number one uh, search engine for professionals. So think about it. Like if you're looking for a baller consultant or a baller speaker or someone like you, you're like – Find me the best. Where do, you can't look on Google. You can't say best CPA on Google. It's fucking nonsense yeah, that who, comes who up, right? The, who has the best selling book in that category? Exactly. You go to Amazon and you look and see who has the best book, right? So that's so many professionals come to us and they're like, okay, like, you know, they don't understand how they're going to use a book. And it's like, well, what do you do? And they're like, well, I am the best CEO coach in the world. Like we actually are doing a book with this guy right now, Cam Harold. He's an amazing CEO coach and he doesn't really have any books out. And it's like, well, why not? And we he kind of went through the thing and he's like, okay. And so we explained uh, exactly how to use Amazon to, to sort of become, instead of SEO, uh, like using SEO to get your website to the top, you use Amazon, you put one or two or three books out there, good books with good knowledge that are professionally done 
on Amazon. And now every CEO, when they uh, Google you, when they're thinking of bringing you on as their coach, they're like, oh, this is the guy who wrote the book on CEO coaching. Of course I'm going to hire him, right? So that's the second way. So that's the thought leadership and authority is one. Second way is sort of becoming, going to the head of the line of sort of professional sort of rankings. And the way to do that is on Amazon. The third big way it can really help businesses is, believe it or not, is by driving leads to your business. So if you have any sort of business where you need customers, which most people who run entrepreneurs are, then a great way to drive leads is to have a book giving away some aspect of your business. So we have a great example is this plumber came to us and he wanted to do a book about, you know, like plumbing. And and he, the, the first thing, his ideas were a little bit goofy. He kind of wanted to do this, basically wanted to do like a self-congratulatory book about, you know, how great his, he built this plumbing business from nothing. And it's like, okay, dude, this is cool, but no one cares. Like, <laughs> no, no, seriously, this is the most important thing to understand when you're writing a book is no one cares about you and no one cares about your book. They care about what they're going to get from your book, right? And so we kind of had to walk him down that, that sort of same path. Who are you trying to influence or reach? What do you know that they're going to find valuable? And lo and behold, this guy, he had a plumbing contracting business, right? So like when a massive building is, needs plumbing contractors, he's sort of the guy that they call. And he came up with this new way to spec out plumbing bids that made it super easy for building contractors, right? So it's like super, super specific. But the people who care about plumbing contractor bids, like they care a lot and they have a lot of money, right? And so basically what we did is we told him to write a book that explained his process and he's like, no one's going to buy it. And we said, no, you're wrong. Every single building contractor in America is going to buy this book and you are going to become the most uh, important and influential voice in plumbing contracting and you're going to have so much business that you won't be able to uh, to keep up with it. He didn't believe us. Well, the book's been out three months. And he, we literally just got off the phone with him two hours ago. And he's like, dude, I just signed a million-dollar contract for some huge thing, a uh, huge complex, whatever. He's like, I'm going to have to hire three more people next week and blah, 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 blah. He's like, how the hell did this happen? Like, how are you doing this? I'm like, it's your book. We didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, it's you put your wisdom out there. So I think you actually nailed it, Mike, is that – all the things that these things have in common, whether it's driving leads to your business or establishing authority or uh, becoming a thought leader or anything like that, what happened, the way you do it is you put something, val- some valuable knowledge or wisdom you have in a book and you share it with the world and then the world will then come to you for business or for consulting or for speaking or for advice or for whatever it is you're trying to sell or to, to get from them. You see? Yeah. And one of the most interesting parts about the book business is that the the value chain basically is is the most backwards in the world, meaning that you can go buy a book on any topic and you're going to get typically a lifetime worth of that author's experience and knowledge for like $10. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. It's unbelievable. Unbe- that, you know, he spent 20, 30 years mastering this topic and he's going to give you everything he knows for $9.95. And, <laughs> and, you know, so uh, the trick to making this worth it is you have to have something, a mechanism on the back end to capture the value that that book creates because it's so out of kilter and there's no money and there's no profit to be made in the actual book itself. Unless your name is JK Rowling or Tom Clancy, you're not going to make any money from your books you know, at a dollar or two, three dollars profit each. And so you have to have the mechanism on the back end to capture the value that your book creates. And so that's one of the pieces that really excites me the most and that I wanted to make sure that we share with everybody today, because that's really where I see the opportunity as. And the best way that I can, I guess, share this is just to talk about, you know, what you and I have been doing with my book and have planned to do, you know, since day one. And you know, magnetic sponsoring, still a, a book that sells every single day. I used to sell it for $39 a copy, you know, ironically when it was an ebook and it didn't cost me anything to make. So I made roughly $39 in profit every time I sold one. You know, now I sell it on Amazon for $9 and I make, you know, uh, $7 in profit, $6 in profit. Yep. But, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting more reach and it's not really an important part of my business anymore, but we've set up an entire marketing funnel behind that book to then take the book customers 
and take them all the way through a process to where, you know, they can become a customer of my other products and end up spending thousands of dollars, you know, down the road. And so one of the things that I want you to think about, uh, for those of you who are listening, if you're like, how can I turn a book into a business opportunity, uh, you know, for you and what you're doing, it can be used to generate an email list and a customer list better than just about anything else out there. And you've probably seen guys like Brendan Bouchard and Joe Vitale and, um, you know, any, who else out there? Tucker has basically been using front end books, marketing those online. Uh, Dan Kennedy is one. He has the the no BS series. Uh, there's so many people that do it now. It's almost like in order to be a legitimate sort of marketer, it seems like you have to have a couple of, of decent books on Amazon. And that really brings me to my second point, which is how screwed up the traditional book industry is and how screwed authors are when it comes to selling and promoting their book. 99% of the people end up writing a book are going to write it. They're going to take a year or two to write it. They're gonna, it's going to be their life's work. They're going to put it on Amazon and no one's ever going to see it. Yep. They're going to put it in a bookstore. No one's ever going to see it. Yep. And so how do you hack the system? How do you get around that? And so there's really three options. There's, you know, option one, which is that you, you write it and you put it out there to the world and keep your fingers crossed, which is a, a, a plan to fail in my opinion. Yep. There's the second option, which is the one that I just referred to as, uh, which is basically taking over and acting as the marketing department yourself, setting up a marketing funnel that your book is the front end of, and that produces enough profit so that you can actively market your book yourself using paid advertising, whether that's on Facebook or Google or whatever it may be. But the economics are in your favor. You've put them in your favor so that you can afford to spend money promoting your book profitably and successfully. Uh, That really has been the most effective in my mind. And then there's the third option, which I would love for you to just spend a couple of minutes talking about, which is, oh, I don't even know how to put this. It's so shocking. And and frankly, I have some pretty strong feelings about this. But Tucker, can you talk about how people get their book to become bestsellers on the New York Times bestselling list? Because it's not. Do you, want, you want to talk about result source? How people cheat, or, you, or you yeah. want to talk about the right way to do it? No, no. I want to talk about. I want to All talk right. about the, so, the cheat, the cheat way, because people do not know about this, and it and it really it, they, the wool has been pulled over a lot of people's eyes. Yeah. So here's the thing. So uh, I, I helped Ryan Holiday start his book marketing company, Brass Check, and um, and Ryan and I, when I was still involved with that, I think. We, we did the marketing for Tim Ferriss's last two books, for 4-Hour Body and 4-Hour Chef, for Robert Greene, for Mastery, for uh, Tony um, – uh, what's his favorite? Robbins. Yeah, Tony Robbins' last book. Like, so uh, uh, Ryan has, I think, done 10 to 15 bestsellers. I forget how many and I've helped him with most of those. We've never used ResultSource but here's what results – ResultSource is a company – And basically what they do is they gain the New York Times bestseller list. And the way that they do it is they uh, bulk order uh, copies of your book from all of the independent bookstores, not the major chains, the independent bookstores that report to the New York Times all around the country. And then you have to pay them the price of the book plus like a a fee. Uh, I don't know. It's usually I think 20% or something like that. So if you want, generally speaking, they'll guarantee you hit the list if I think uh, 10,000 books and that's a hardcover. You're looking at spending $250,000, which is what the vast majority of people who gain the list, that's what they do. And how, 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 Many would you say out of the top twenty people who are on the New York Times bestselling list, or, or how many do you would you say or that have hit number one have gamed it like that? Um, it, man, it's really hard to say. It's really hard. It, it if I looked at, the, I think there are weeks where I think there's maybe even five people on the list that are are, are in some way manipulating or or, or sort of uh, gaming the list. There are other weeks where I don't think anyone on the list is doing it. I know Results Source will only take, I think, two or three clients per week because they can only sure. do this so much before like the New York Times catches on. I'll tell you, it's pretty encouraging though. I know Results Source is in real trouble because the last three clients, they they guarantee that you're going to hit the list. And the last three clients... I know that they've had to refund uh, money to, and there was like a new an article about this somewhere because the New York Times has somehow figured out a way to catch on to them, mm. and so they're not as effective anymore. But huge, huge numbers of people who call themselves New York Times bestsellers 
are basically paid a quarter million dollars to get that. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. absolutely true. Yeah. yeah, and you know what's funny too? You know what the, the 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 scam is now is that a bunch of people will put number one best selling book on the top of their thing, and there's ways to game Amazon. And Amazon has started putting like you know number one bestseller in a category thing. So someone will figure out that there's people you can buy the, this service from for five or ten thousand dollars online, and they'll basically game Amazon so that for like an hour or two, you're number one in this tiny category, like like 17th century French knitting <laughs> novels, you know? And so it'll say number one bestseller and then they'll screenshot that and oh, it's proof I'm number one and whatever. And then they put number one bestseller. So like that, it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of weird. The only bestseller list anyone cares, there's two really that anyone cares about. New York Times and Wall Street Journal are the two. And Wall Street Journal is actually very hard to game because they just use BookScan, which is Nielsen, Nielsen sort of uh, measures all the sort of books that are sold. The New York Times list is actually curated. So they actually pick what goes on their list and what doesn't. And they'll cut a lot of books out that they don't think are high status enough for them. I've seen it happen all over and over <laughs> and over. It happened with you. <laughs> and it's happened with me. I mean, like, it, my book should have been, my book had enough to be number one for about three years in a row. Like, consistently, my book was top five. And almost every week, it was enough to be number one. They wouldn't make it number one until it was 4x the second book. It was pretty amazing. Ridiculous. Huh? Like, uh, but, um, yeah, so the, the New York Times, because they heavily weight the independence, because the New York Times, they want their list to reflect what they call the thinking people's books, right? Yeah. Which is the most condescending elitist stuff on earth. But that's the way that they do it. And Results Source was essentially charging to gain that. Yeah, interesting. I just I wanted everyone to know that because you know it it happens in the marketing circle quite a bit. Who people I know who've taken advantage of the service and it drives me insane. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so with that being said, you know the good <laughs> the good news here is that you don't have to game the system to nope. get to get life changing results from a book. You know, as we've we've really discussed here earlier. And so let's talk a little bit about you know, how do you write a book? You know, how do you go through this process? Because you, you know, there's been nightmare stories about people locking themselves away in a jungle, you know, mountain, mountain villa for three months, six months at a time until they write this book and like it's pulling teeth and yada, yada, yada. And, and I have to say that in my experience, it hasn't been anything like that. And until I met you, I had never traditionally published a book, you know, with a, an IBN number and, and hard, a hard cover and, you know, professional editing and all of this other stuff. And I didn't know who to turn to, to even get it done. I didn't know how much it was going to cost. And I didn't know what the process looked like. But obviously, we got introduced uh, when I was thinking about taking Magnetic and taking it from an ebook and making it, you know, a real book and in, 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 uh, for lack of a better term. But uh, it was an amazing process, man. Like what you guys helped me accomplish with Magnetic and how quickly we got it done and for the price that we got it done was I still I still don't know how how y'all managed to pull that off. So <laughs> we had great margins. I felt like uh I was super happy with the deal. <laughs> okay. Well, that's it's unbelievable in my mind. So if you could walk people through who are, are sitting there like, "You know what? I have a business. I could definitely write a book." And I could definitely, if nothing else, use it to help build my marketing funnel, build my list, build my audience, if nothing else. And they've never done it before. How do they do it? How do you write a book? Okay. So this is actually literally what you kind of just talked about is what my company does. Like we, for years, people have been asking me sort of uh, exactly what you said. I've got wisdom. I've got knowledge. I want a book because you want the results that come from a book, but I'm not a writer and I don't have time to sit down and dedicate a year to this. So how do I sort of uh, make a book. So we actually, that's why we started this company is that we've developed a process where people can spend 12 hours on the phone with us and we can figure out, you know, what their goal is, what uh, audience they're trying to reach and what wisdom they have or knowledge they have that's valuable to that audience. And then that's the book, right? And we, 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 we have a process where we out help them or not help them. We do the outlining and we interview them and we turn that into a fully published professional book. But, you know, we're, we're kind of expensive. So let me walk you through. Let me walk, walk your listeners through how to do this on their own if you want to. So, uh, again, I've said this over and over. I cannot emphasize this enough. No one cares about you. No one cares about what you have to say. No one cares about your book. They only care about how your book is going to help them. That's the key to a nonfiction book 
is having an ROI that the audience understands and that the readers understand. So what you want to do is sit down and say, what is my goal for this book? And of course, everyone wants to sell a lot of books and everyone wants to be a best-selling author and all that kind of stuff. But like more realistically, what how are you going to use this book to get a result? Like what's the result you're looking for? Whether it's I want to be a thought leader in my space so I can do speaking gigs or I want to drive clients to my consulting business or I want to you know, lead gen for my business or whatever it is I want to do, right? Uh, you know, I want to uh, collect emails for my marketing funnel. There's a million legit reasons. So understand what that is. And then you understand, okay, my goal is X. Now you have to figure out what audience do I need to hit, right? So who, who am I talking to? And uh, believe it or not, everyone wants to say, oh, my book is for everybody. Bullshit. No book is for everyone. Not even the Bible. Muslims aren't going to read the Bible. Like, you know, like <laughs> there's no book that's for everybody. Okay. And so you need to figure out who your book is for. And the more specific, the better. Everyone thinks they have this sort of image in their head uh, that broad, big categories are better to attack, it's actually not true. Because broad, big categories are hard to nail down, hard to define, and hard to reach. But small, specific niches are usually totally underserved and usually much easier to reach. So like the examples I gave, new surgeons is a tiny, tiny market, but it's totally underserved. No one has taught these people how to run their careers, right? Or plump, uh, uh, independent contractors or building contractors is a tiny market, but they need plumbing contractors and no one's written a book explaining sort of how to spec out jobs the right way. So a small market where you can nail is actually better. Then the third thing you need to think is, all right, what wisdom do I have? What knowledge do I have that's going to be really valuable to this market, that I, this audience that I've identified? That's your book. That's it. That's 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 the topic now of your book. And then and then you know what happens at that point? Do you okay. go? Do you go look for a publisher? You know. No, <laughs> well, I mean, you can if you want. The, the the traditional publishing route is you convince an agent to represent you, and then the agent you fly to New York, and the agent takes you in all these meetings, and it's this huge song and dance, and. And good luck even getting to that stage because traditional publishing companies like Simon & Schuster and Harper, they want, they only want authors who have huge, huge audience, huge platforms who are going to already going to sell tens if not hundreds of thousands of copies of their book. And the irony of that is if you have a huge platform, you don't need a publisher. Like you can do all that on your own. That's what's kind of funny. So that's why traditional publishers are sort of in a lot of trouble actually because uh, of, of that reason. But no, that process really sucks. And especially if you have a relative, if you've identified a small underserved niche and you know exactly what they need to know, so you've develop, developed a perfect book idea, then HarperCollins doesn't care about selling 5,000 books a year, right? Even though that surgeon I, ta- I told you about, he's got an amazing consulting and speaking business off of the back of this book. He's doing like 20 speeches a year at like 50 grand a pop or 25 grand a pop, whatever. And he's consulting with all these med schools and all these hospitals about developing courses for teaching surgeons how to run their career. So he's making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars eventually off of this book, even though it only sells 5,000 copies a year, right? And so Harper doesn't care about those, those ancillary revenue streams, but you do because you're an entrepreneur, right? So what you should do at that point is you need to understand you're going to write this book yourself. Either you're going to hire someone like me and my company to help you do it, or you're going to do it yourself. If you're going to do it yourself, I would actually recommend you use the same method that we do. You can Listen, you can sit down at your computer for five hours a day and type everything out. That is absolutely unequivocally possible, but if you're running a business, you probably don't have that time. So what we've actually done in our company is we've figured out a way that people can essentially basically talk their book by, we call it recording the rough draft of your audio book first, right? So what you do is once you know exactly what you're gonna say, right, you, you, know, you know what your goal is, who your audience is, and what, your, uh, what wisdom you have that's valuable to that audience, then you just create a book outline from that. And it's essentially like, generally speaking, you're going to be nonfiction stuff that's going to be teaching people something. So all you have to do is is imagine someone in your head who doesn't understand what you understand and then walk them through it step by step. Part one, uh, learning, you know, like uh, whatever, learning 
the first part about plumbing contracting, part two, the second part, part three, the third part, and then organize all the things you want to say, right? And then basically record yourself talking about each thing. This is what we do at our companies. We have a, it's a little bit more structured, but it's essentially we get people to talk everything out. Then we take that audio transcription. You can do the same thing. You can go to SpeechPad or Rev are the two companies we use. Uh, Rev has an app on your iPhone. Uh, and you can plug right in, put your credit card right in, you record things, you just hit send, and then they send the transcription back, totally tra- perfectly transcribed like 12 hours later. It's amazing. Mm. SpeechPad is a little bit more complicated, but they're both about a dollar a minute, give or take. From there, you essentially have, now transcript is not a book. You can put the transcript into a book, but it's not going to do real well, right? So what you need to do is uh, find a good editor to sort of help translate uh, that transcript into sort of book prose, right? Uh, you can look on Elance, you can look on uh, Odesk, you can look on, there's a, a place called Readsy that has a lot of editors. It's kind of like a, a, a book platform. Also, blurb.com actually is probably the best. There's also um, Scripted, there's a couple of others. Uh, Scrivener, uh, where like basically it's just pl- a platform that connects authors to editors. And uh, pick someone you really like. Understand, just tell them. Say, listen, this is an audio transcript. I need you to sort of rewrite this. Same words, same ideas, same sort of phrases, but make it flow on the page, right? And you should pay anywhere from five to ten, maybe fifteen thousand dollars. No more than twenty, and that's a rock, rock star editor for that process. And uh, they should, it, it should come back, and you should feel like when you look at your. Manuscript. It should be anywhere from fifteen thousand to fifty thousand words, usually depending on on what you have to say. And you should look at them, read the manuscript, and you should think, "Wow, I feel like this is me talking. You know, this sounds like me. This is saying what I have to say. This resonates with what I'm trying to teach. This this feels right to me. And if it doesn't, then just go back and forth with the editor. Then from the, at that point, you'll have a, sort of a, you know, either a rough draft or a finished manuscript. Then from there, what you need to do is you need to you really need to spend time getting a good cover design. I cannot emphasize this enough. The difference between amateur self-publishing and good professional publishing is editing, cover design, and interior layout. Like if you do a qual, people will judge your book based on the cover and the interior design and the and spelling and grammar errors far more than they will the content. It's not fair. It's not maybe right in the grand scheme of things, but it is exactly how all of us judge things. Uh, it's just a reality. People do judge book, the book by the cover. So I would actually go to 99designs. They, you can get really good covers at 99designs. Make sure you pick the $500 or the $1,000 option. Don't go below the $500 prize. Be very, very clear with the designers and then give like three, four, five examples of book covers you really love. Say, I like these three or these five covers. I want my cover to kind of look like that in various ways, maybe you know, with these icons instead of this other thing, et cetera. And from there, usually what we do is, is I don't know, uh, you, you can get good ones there. If you're not happy, you can just refund everything. You can cancel the contest and then go hire a professional book cover designer. They're going to be $1,000 to $2,000, $1,500 But you want a really good cover, right? Then from there, you actually need to get the interior designed. We use a company called uh, Design Pros. They're super, super good. Yeah, I, I know you can go on Kindle and just uh, auto-translate a Word doc to a Mobi file, but then what happens is when people read it in a Kindle, it, there's all these formatting issues, and it just looks totally jacked up. And by the way, that, that's not formatted at all for hardcover or proper formatting for paperback, and so it's going to look really bad if you actually have print uh, cover. So you need to get the interior layout done right because design matters. From there... You can just publish it on Amazon, iBooks, et cetera. Then the rest is marketing, which I don't – your audience, you probably teach them enough about marketing. They could probably teach me how to market stuff. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's – you know, one of the important steps in that process that I would encourage people to take as well, and, and you're going to chime in on this, is split testing your cover design and your title. And yeah. so, you know, ideally you have a, a, at least a tiny audience of, you know, 30 to 50 family and friends or colleagues or whatever it may be that you can pull and, and more people, the better. Uh, but if you don't, you can always do, you know, spend $100, $200 on, on some Facebook ads. But essentially, 
you really, really, really want to split test the headline of your book or the title and the cover design because it will absolutely make a huge difference. And I want to use this as you know, one example that I use in my my marketing tucker is, you know, we were going to come up with a product name and we had two domain names. We had two product names registered and we were trying to figure out which one to use. One was wiring your mind for wealth. The other was wiring your mind for money completely identical except for the last word and right. you know very very close right so we're like well gosh i don't know which we should use but i i, I bet wiring your mind for wealth won uh going away in a split test right it won by 98 percent. yeah I, you know why right why uh, the Alliter- alliteration exactly yeah, yeah. It, more of a rhyme to it but mm-hmm. you know okay great i would have guessed 55% to 45%, you know, I would not have guessed nine to nine to one, 10 to one odds. Yeah. So guys, I want you to realize that if we hadn't split tested the title, we would have lost basically 97% of our business. And so that to me is unbelievably important. And I know you guys have gone through that process as well. We do that for our authors is that if there's any sort of discrepancy with titles, then we we throw in, uh, we actually do Survey Monkey uh, or Wufu form sort yeah. of uh, things on Mechanical Turk. It's the same thing now. Yeah, like uh, that's super, super important. I mean, that, that made, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss' book as well. It was originally yep. not going to be the four hour work week. He ran, a no. spl- he ran a split test and that was the winner. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you know what he was going to call it? Like, I helped. It's him. some long contrived something it, it was it was going to be called drug dealing for fun and profit okay <laughs> because, you know because he came out of the pharmaceutical industry right you know and uh and so like dr- could you imagine a four-hour work week was called drug dealing for fun and profit like i don't think it would be four-hour work week well we wouldn't we wouldn't know about it <laughs> right but, exactly. You know, yeah. exactly yeah very cool so I'll say that I went through, obviously went through this process with you guys. The one, the one step that we got to skip was basically the actual writing of the book itself because I ar- had already had it written. And I handed over the Word file to you guys and, and your team picked it up and ran with it. And I have to say that it was an unbelievably fantastic experience because I didn't have to do really anything. That's Y'all, the way a service business should be, though, shouldn't I, it, Mike? Well, well, no, agreed. And that's why it was so awesome. You know, my most valuable asset as a business owner is time. Yep. And I need to be spending my time doing what I do best. And publishing a book in the traditional publishing industry would make my head spin. You know, formatting the thing on a Kindle, it's an absolute nightmare for someone like me who wants to do this because I see the benefits of having a book, but, you know, it's not my area of expertise. Right. And so. You know, for those of you who are listening out there, if you're interested in publishing a book, I cannot recommend uh, Tucker and his company uh, more because I'm, I am a, uh, I am a client and a result of the process, and it was absolutely awesome. And frankly, like I said at the beginning of this, uh, the price is uh, is something that I I couldn't really get over. I don't know how you guys, you know, make a profit and stay in business, frankly. But, um, you know, more power to you for that. Well, it, I, honestly, man, it, it, we have just applied really smart principles. Like we, we templatized almost everything. And then we have super high skilled people in, in very short bursts in the places where they're needed. And everything else is just either automated or VAs, you know? Yeah, no, it's been it was awesome. And so, you know, let's go ahead and imagine somebody's gone through that process with you and, and you've, they've got their book. It's on right. Kindle. It's on hardcover. It's on paperback, whatever it may be. You know, let's talk a little bit about the marketing and the launch of that book because everyone's going to be in a very different place. I'm going to assume that you're brand new, you don't have an audience, you don't have a list. And you know, I like to use my friend Christina as, as an example for this, and she's probably getting tired of me doing this, but she's a perfect example. She's been a, a lifelong friend of mine. She's my age. She has two young kids, and she just wrote two books. And uh, the first one is Secrets of the Supermom. And it's basically you know, what she's learned being a mother of two kids and, and, you know, staying in shape and fitness and parenting and the whole gig. And they're fantastic books, but her plan was to write the books and sell them and make money, you know, make, make a significant amount of money every month. And I've basically known from day one that that's just not going to happen again. As we mentioned, there's no profit margin in books. Right. And so, you know, we've been putting together a marketing funnel for her to where she's essentially going to be giving away the books for free plus shipping. 
Yep. And so, you know, someone will pay $5.95 for shipping and they'll get a free paperback copy of her book in the mail. And as someone goes through the checkout process, once they, they hit, you know, submit on their order, they're taken to uh, a secondary page where she offers access to a private community for moms and for her book customers and her fans for, I think we priced it at $197 a year. And it's a, a private community where she gets to deliver more value on a weekly basis to those people, holds live webinars, does Q&A and, you know, writes more articles and all kinds of stuff that follows up with the book. And we're just about to take that live. And if my numbers hold true, you know, for her numbers and her audience, about one in five of her book buyers are going to spend the, the $200 to join and become a member. Right. And that money is then taken back and, you know, put into marketing to go out and advertise on Facebook and on Google so that she can then acquire, you know, let's say 5, 10, 15, 20 new book customers a day. And then again, one out of five will pay for the pay for the upsell and the membership. That money's poured back into it as well. It's almost like you're an expert at this, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I've done it a couple times. And uh, and so that is how she is self-funding without spending really any money out of her pocket because this is being funded by her customers, the building of her brand and the selling of her books and the building of her email list. And you know what I really try to hit home with her, hammer home with her, is that your book is not a business. Books are not a business. They are a product. Your business, in my mind, is your distribution channel. And that's your, that's your email list. That's your audience, whether they're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, you know, email, whatever it may be, that distribution channel, that audience is your is your business because that's how you move goods and services through and actually monetize your audience. Just like Starbucks, their business is not coffee. I promise you it's not. They're actually in the distribution industry. And if you think that I'm wrong, well, just take all of their coffee, take away their distribution network, put it in a warehouse somewhere and tell me what's going to happen. They're not going to sell anything because their distribution network was the business and their coffee was the product. Yep. So... What we want to do is basically launch your book and use your book, essentially give it away for free. You've got to have at least one offer on the back end to help monetize that and pay for your advertising. But at that point, your audience is essentially allowing you to purchase paid advertising to build your list, build your business, and it can just spiral upward to where you're selling 30, 40, 50, you know, 100, 200, 300 books a day and building your list and building your audience. And then once you have a list of a few thousand people, you know, a couple, 10, 20,000 people, that is then worth, you know, six, multiple six figures a year in revenue when you come out with other products or other books or you promote somebody else's services as an affiliate, whatever it may be. But that's how you turn a book into a business and how you build an audience with it and build a distribution network with it. And so... I would encourage everyone, if you have an idea you know, for a book, if you're an expert in some form or fashion, and if you really want to take your business to the next level and create a marketing funnel that is unbelievably effective, because that's really a book is at the top of the list from an effectiveness standpoint. People understand it. They get a huge amount of value from it. it it's just a win-win-win in every single category. That's how it's done. And if you don't want to dive down that rabbit hole yourself. Just do what I did and call Tucker and, and go check out Book in a Box. They're awesome. And that's how you turn a book into a business, guys. And it's just been a, a really, really effective marketing tool for me that's, again, you know, made well over $25 million for me over the last 10 years. So you know, obviously, it works. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and here's the thing, too, is that uh, the way you outlined building a marketing funnel is not the only way to like we talked about other ways like that's for people in information business. That's the thing. But if you're selling more sort of services or whatever, then the book can just be straight lead gen, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, it works multiple different ways. It's not just like it's not there's not one way to use a book to build a business. That's also the cool thing about books is that it works on multiple levels. It makes you an expert, it drives people to your thing, and then it brings people into your funnel. Either all three if you want all three, or if you want to do each one independently for different reasons. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, what do people what do people do if they want to reach out to you and, and contact you and talk to you about helping bring their book to life? And so the, kind of the best thing to do is come to the website, bookinabox.com, and it, it explains our entire process. Uh, and then there's a, just a little form at the bottom. Fill that out. Our head of book development will reach out to you, set up a call, 
and um, we'll we'll figure help you figure out if a book makes sense. Like we don't actually even take we don't just take anybody as clients. We try and only take people because uh, we're not you know we're not cheap. Um, we do an amazing job, but we're not cheap, and so we want to make sure that everyone we take as a client is someone who can actually use this book to either build a business or in some way ROI it, or that you know they have plenty of money, so it's not an issue even if they don't care about ROI, whatever. Because people ultimately care about getting something. We just want to make sure that like they're not, you know, they're not spending their last dime on this uh, with some crazy dream about becoming Malcolm Gladwell or something. <laughs> there you go. Well, that's that's awesome of you. I mean, that's that's really cool that you guys make sure that a win, a win is on the horizon. You know. Yeah, because it doesn't help us to to work with people who who can't win from this process. Then they're just going to be mad at us, even if we do everything right. You yeah, know. That's awesome. Awesome. Awesome, brother. Well, I definitely appreciate you taking the time to come out and really shed some light on the publishing industry, which you know has been going through an unbelievable amount of change over the last you know five to ten years. And you know, you've been at the forefront in many ways, the cause or the instigator of of much of that change, which has been awesome. So, it's a, a real privilege to call you a friend and to have worked with you on my project. And uh, man, it's just been a pleasure today. So, thanks so much for all of your wisdom and insights. Yeah, Mike, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Awesome, brother. We'll take care, and uh, looking forward to hanging out soon. Okay. Yo, check this out.